Okay, hi, I'm Rob Brown. Um, so we're gonna uh, build a very simple telescope that will um, be functional, hopefully learn something about how optics work in the process, and more importantly, uh, learn how to use a telescope. Um, that should be part and parcel of this, uh, of this club anyway. So now Joe, um, you just, you just uh, stole my thunder, I suppose, but oh, okay, maybe we can make this work. All right. I was just messing around, but here. Okay, let's, let so me... you, you, should, you should have a bag that looks just like what Joe put on the, on the tabletop. Let's go with this and let's see how it works. Okay, I can see it every time. Okay, okay. I was Let's trying to see this. if I could do a split screen with you and the bag. Oh, okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make Joe uh, follow along with what I do, and you follow along with what you see on your screen, and hopefully everybody stays together that way. There's a there are um, I think there's there's either fourteen. I think there's 14 parts in the bag. Let's 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 count them out as we go. Maybe we'll start off with a piece of black ABS pipe. This is Schedule 40 ABS used on used on drains. You can find long lengths of it in the hardware store. And then you'll find another piece of black ABS. And this is a um, this is a coupling that's used in a uh, in a drain coming out of your kitchen sink, for example, there would be like a chrome pipe. Turns out that that chrome pipe has a diameter of an inch and a quarter, which is exactly the diameter of standard eyepieces in astronomy. If you would take this and stick it into, whoop, hold on a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Find this piece of black ABS. This is an inch and a half to two inch pipe adapter. So we can take a, a two inch pipe and we can stick the large end of the adapter on either end of the pipe, cram it in there real good, and you'll now have a pipe that adapts down to an inch and a half. And then take your, your uh, coupling and stick that into the small end of your pipe adapter, like so. Oh my gosh, it's starting to look like a telescope already. It's got a big end and a, and a small end. Anybody have a, have a guess which end we're gonna end up looking in? Put it up to your eye, just so we don't all have to talk. Put it up to your eye the way you think you're gonna observe through it. Okay, very good, very good. Yeah, we're gonna look through the small end. Okay, now reach in your bag and get out this here piece of white plastic. Hey Rob, before you this go too far, yes, go ahead. In the uh, the last piece we put on, there is a plastic piece within there that I think yeah. kind of different colors. Some like mine's blue. Yeah, mine's orange. Yours is blue. Some are white. Some are orange. Some are blue. There might even be a black. I don't know. Some are clearish, whitish. I don't know. Don't worry about that. Just make sure that there's something in there. So, okay. So yeah, get this, this white piece of plastic out. Now this is not ABS. You'll notice it's really dense and heavier. It's polyvinyl chloride or PVC. And this is a coupling to attach two pipes together. And we're gonna use it to mount our objective lens. And so if you reach down in your bag, you'll find probably wrapped in tissue, possibly wrapped in bubble, bubble wrap, Go ahead and open it up and handle it by the edges. Don't, don't grab the surfaces. So you wanna hold your objective lens by the edges so you don't get fingerprints all over it. Keep your optics clean. In fact, in optics factories, they will never touch optics with their bare hands, always with rubber gloves on. Okay, so you can take that lens out and then hold it edgewise. And you'll see that one side looks more curved than the other. One side looks kind of flat, one side looks kind of curved, okay? Get that? Now I want you to take that lens and lay it down, flat side down on the tissue paper. Okay. And we're gonna, we're gonna take a little time here to try to understand this lens, okay? So grab your ruler 
And hopefully all of you have somewhere in your room a light source, be it a light bulb up overhead. I've got one kind of sitting here on my desk. There's no sun out, that's too bad. But um, in this, you're actually gonna, you're gonna stand up, grab your sheet of white paper, grab your ruler, grab your lens by the edges. I know you need three hands. Actually, you don't have to have a sheet of white paper if you have a, a white spot on your wall or something. What you're gonna do is you're gonna hold the lens so that the curved side faces a distant light source. And if you, oh, a, a, a flashlight off of a, off of a cell phone is fine, but set your cell phone across the room. Don't put it where you're working because you want that light source to be kind of far away like a star would be. And I don't, I don't know if this is gonna show up at all, but if I, let's see if I do it maybe up here. If I bring this lens to there, I don't know, can you see the light forming on the other side of the, right there, that little spot of light? Does that show up anybody? Maybe if I do it down here, does that show up? Hang on a second, Rob. Yeah, make me the, make me primary here. Yeah, try again. This one too. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is this is disadvantageous for sure. But let's see, let's see, where am I now? Does that show up? See a little spot of light right at the end of my ruler? Yes. Anybody see it? Yes. Okay. So I actually see an upside down image of the light bulb that's on my desk, and I'd like you all to do basically the same thing. And then what you're going to do is hold the ruler on the screen or on the board or wall or whatever you're using and measure the distance from that white, from that spot of light, that focused spot of light to the backside of the lens. And I, I, get, a, I get a distance that I'm not gonna tell you, but they're all the same. I get, okay, I get a number. Everybody and, get a number, write it down, but don't say it out loud. Yep. Influence others. There you go. And then I'm going to write my number down on my sheet of paper with my okay. big marker here. Rob, what units are we measuring in? Well, um, I like to do everything in millimeters, but I don't care. I can work in any units. Let, if people have millimeter rulers, though, let's do that. That way we don't have to convert. Okay. Let's do that. So I'm going to, I'm going to remeasure because it just happened that I put my ruler up there on the inch side. <laughs> Let's do that. All righty. So Rob, just to be clear, the curved side is up and we're measuring from the spot to the flat side or the curved side? Flat side. Okay, near side. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if everybody's had a chance to do that, I'm going to hold up my numbers. I did them in both inches and millimeters. What'd you get? Hold up your numbers. Hold them up. What are, hold them up, guys. Come on. Supposed to be measuring. My internet went out. Oh. Well, oh no. I'm sorry, Dora. One more time. So what we're gonna do, you know what? I'm gonna do this real close and it's gonna be wrong. But, oh, look at that, look at that. So I've got a light bulb right off, right off this way. And I put my lens up and hold a sheet of paper there. And what we're doing is we're measuring the, the space between the lens and the sheet of paper. But you wanna do it where the, where the light source is much further away. It should be like all the way across the room. See that image I'm getting? Neat, huh? That's what lenses do. Okay, so I got some numbers. Put up your, put up your numbers, everybody. You all should have them by now. Hold them right up in front of your camera so I can see them. They're all waiting for the answer before they write it down and then hold it up. So here, Rob, here's a trick that I do sometimes in class. Yeah. I'd like everyone to put their answer in a chat 
but don't hit return until I say go. That way everyone, it's like everyone's speaking at the same time. All so, right. First of all, does everyone know what you're measuring and did you get a measurement? If not, speak up. One more time for Dora, because I didn't really finish with, with you, Dora, sorry. So you've got, you've got a light bulb. Maybe it's on your desk, maybe it's in your ceiling. Get as far away from that light bulb as you can and use a wall or your sheet of paper and focus an image of that light bulb with your lens and put the ruler right on that, right on that image, measuring millimeters here, put the ruler right on the image, put your lens right on the ruler get it nice and sharply focused, and then measure the distance between the, the screen or that image and the, and the backside of the lens. So you're just kind of sliding the lens along, along the ruler like this until you get a nice sharp focus and you just read the numbers. All right. Okay, it's time. Are you ready? Okay, I'm gonna count back from five. When I hit zero, hit return on your text. You've got a number in millimeters, or if you did it in inches, list that. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one, return. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Good. If you're using units, you're all you're all in the ballpark. Okay. Right. Excellent. Now there's some variability and the reason for that is because everybody's got a different distance between the lens and the light source and that affects the that affects the number a little bit. But if that light source were a star or the sun really really far away, we'd all get the same answer. So, anyway, if you got a bigger number, that means you were closer. If you got a smaller number, it means you were farther away. Okay, good. So, what we want to make sure of now is when we put our lens inside of this assembly that we've got about 140, 145 millimeters between the, front of, between the front of this tube and the back of this tube. Let's just check it. Did I, did I build them right? So hold your ruler up like that and take a measurement. Is it at least 140 millimeters from one end to the other on your tube assembly? And my, my answer is I got 145. Anybody uh, get anything substantially different? Type it in the chat. I got 145 too. Rob, should we tell them what the manufacturer claims the number should be? Yeah, yeah. These are 138 millimeter lenses. And um, the reason why we measured longer is because our light sources are too close. And that, that number has a name. I don't think we've mentioned it. Oh yeah, it's called focal length. Kind of makes sense. It's the length over which light comes to a focus from that lens. God, I wish we could do this in person. Oh man. <laughs> I've been saying that for months, Rob. <laughs> but okay. Yep, yep, yep. All right, we'll move on. Now, what you're gonna do is pick up your lens again by the edges, hold it so the curved side is up, Get your white pipe and you're just going to let that drop into the white pipe like that. You now have a lens inside of a pipe. Okay. And now go matter, ahead and it should just drop down halfway and stop. Rob, does it matter which end of the white pipe? Nope. Doesn't matter which end. It's symmetric, isn't it? Yep. Then you're going to find in your bag a little ring. Okay. And what you're gonna do is uh, the ring tapers, there's kind of a sharp edge. You're gonna put it on um, dull edge into your white piece of plastic on top of your lens, slide it in there and then push it all the way down inside until it touches the lens all the way around. And that keeps the lens from falling out. We used to do this with tape and this is much better. So now that lens doesn't fall out. It's still in there and it's nice and secure. It's not permanent, of course. So be careful with these things when you're out there using them. If you were to drop it, the lens could easily fall out. Okay, now inside your bag, there should be a loose screw and it should look like this. 
got a loose screw. And on your pipe, oh, sure enough, I did, there was an end for the pipe and I did mine wrong. I'm so glad I did. Okay, you should see two holes in your piece of ABS pipe and I only see one sitting right there. There should be one up here. So I'm gonna take my pipe out and I'm gonna turn it over, plug it back in and lo and behold, I've got a, a hole that's right up here close to the front. Make sure that you have a threaded hole up close to the front and then stick your, your screw in that hole and just give it a couple of turns. Don't let it poke through the other side yet, but just make sure that it's in there a little bit. Once you got your screw in there, then you're going to put your lens in. Now again, you're gonna put your lens in so that the curved side is facing up. And this should just go right into the ABS pipe. It might be a little tight like it is on mine. There we go. Okay, and just push it down until maybe about a finger's width is still showing. The screw is there to hold it tight in case it isn't already tight. Some of these will be very loose. Some of these will be very tight. I got one of the tighter ones. So now, have we built a telescope yet? In fact, in fact, we have, but it's not a complete system because this thing will, will form an image. We've, we've already done that, but nothing special here, except now the image is gonna be inside this tube. But now we have to have some way of looking at that image. And if you put your eyeball, go ahead and do this. You put your eyeball right up to that tube, everything's gonna be out of focus and, and it doesn't work. So now what we need, we have an objective lens for looking at the object that we wanna look at. Now we need what's called an eyepiece, or some people like to call them oculars. Eyepiece works just fine with me. So take your eyepiece out of its little plastic housing, and you're going to stick the eyepiece into this end here. Now it might also be tight. If it's tight, you can loosen up this, this big outer nut here. Once you get your eyepiece in, you can go ahead and tighten that down so your eyepiece doesn't fall out. Okay. Now on most telescopes, you'll have a focuser that kind of sits right here by the eyepiece and you turn a knob and the eyepiece moves in and out, okay? Just like you're moving the, the lens in and out over on the wall. But these are so small and these fittings aren't so good that I decided the best way to do this was to use that screw, loosen up the screw and you're gonna focus the telescope by turning and sliding the objective lens in its white coupler, okay? And now that you've done that, find the farthest thing away that you can see. If it's in your room, down the hall, out the window, I got a window, so I'm gonna look out the window, put the eyepiece up there, and then I'm gonna try pulling the lens out. Yeah, it wants to come out a little bit, okay. And I see something. I see some trees. Cool. There's my telescope. I love it. Show me your telescopes, you guys. And then we'll have a discussion. Sorry, I came a little late. Um, so I, got, I don't know this piece to put that lens in. So which piece do I, how do I put that lens in? So I have this lens ah, here. Okay. Let me, let me back up to your step here. So, I will push my lens out. Boom. Okay, so you got your white PVC tube and you have a lens. Your lens has a curved side and a flat side. Did you notice that? Make sure the curved side is up and you'll just bring that lens right over the tube and just let go of it and it'll drop down in. Okay, awesome. And it'll just hit a seat down there. Uh -huh. Yeah, then there's a white plastic ring and you're gonna stuff that ring down in on top of the lens. It doesn't really matter which way the ring goes, by the way, guys, just stuff it down in there until it sits against the lens. That keeps the lens from falling out. Okay, got it. Put your objective cell into the telescope, put your eyepiece into the other end, find something far away. Now, is anybody able to look at something inside your room? 
just wave or something. If you can see something inside your room, wave. All right, Maxwell could do it. All right, cool. All right, good, nice. So these are these these little these little telescopes are pretty nifty because you know you can you can uh, pack them in a in a coat pocket and you know bring it to the the next concert you ever get to go to. <laughs> Or, you know, bring it to the, if you're into bird watching and you don't have a pair of binoculars, this is basically one half of a pair of binoculars right here. So it gives a pretty good image. Now, general discussion. When I look in this thing, everything's upside down. Is that right? It is. Anybody wanna know why? We're gonna, we're gonna go to the whiteboard and, and talk about that. Oh, and then there's one more optic that, that we'll do too, but that's kind of peripheral. So let's talk about why, and I'm gonna see if I can make this whiteboard work. And if not, then maybe, uh, maybe Joe can do these diagrams for me, but oh, not the Sharpie. There it is, the dry erase marker. I got both on my desk. Okay. And since I'm left-handed, I'll come over to the other side of the whiteboard. So the lens that you have in your hands kind of looks like that. It's curved on one side and flat on the other, right? In fact, uh, inside that lens, if you look closely, it's really two lenses bonded together. One lens sitting here and one lens sitting here. And they're made out of two different kinds of glasses. That's not important right now, but that's what your lens looks like. Now what happens when light comes into this lens, here's rays of light. And those rays of light are traveling parallel to each other, like railroad tracks. These rays of light came from an object that was infinitely far away in practical terms, a star, okay? So if I try to measure the angle between these two rays, star is so far away that these rays have no angle between them. They are parallel. Now, when light hits, a surface, glass or plastic that's transparent, what does it do? I'm gonna draw another piece of glass sitting right here. Here's a little piece of glass. Here's a ray that's coming in. If I continue drawing this ray, which way does my pen go? Tell me. It's gonna, it's gonna go to the right, but am I gonna go straight or up or down? Down. Down, I like that. It's gonna, it's gonna go down, right. And that is a property called, called refraction. And there's some math for that, I'm not gonna go into it. But because we're using a lens made out of glass and light bends, which is a, uh, Bending is, um, uh, I'm sorry, it refracts, which comes from the Latin word to bend or to break. And because we're using a lens that reflect, refracts light, we are calling this, this telescope a refractor. So refractor, okay? There's another kind of telescope and it's called a reflector. And instead of a lens, it uses a mirror. And now I'll make a curved mirror sitting right here. And if I bring rays in parallel to a curved mirror, they reflect off the mirror and come to a focus. This focus point right here, we just measured, we put a ruler across that lens and we measured how far it was from the backside of the lens to the surface. And we're calling that the focal length. And we all got something about 140 millimeters or 14 centimeters, right? There you go. So that's. That's how a telescope works. It's as simple as that. But there's one more funny thing, which was that I looked out there at a tree and it was upside down. So I've got a tree. Let's say I've got a tree standing way out there in the distance. Does that look like a tree? <laughs> and the image of the tree looked like this. Upside down. And why was that? Well, this is a, a fundamental property of optics. You've probably all heard that the images in our inside of our eyeballs are upside down and that our brain has to turn them over inside our 
inside our brain processors. Um, you might have played with lenses before and seen that images are upside down, so it's no surprise. But what's really going on? Why is it so? Let's, let's draw this tree really big. There's a tree. Here's our lens. And over here is our screen. So the focal length of the lens is from here to here. And if I draw a ray from, say, the middle of the tree through the middle of the lens, it's just going to go straight on through because it didn't see any curved surfaces to bend it. If it goes from the top of the tree through the middle of the lens, it's going to go straight on through because we went through the flat part of the lens. But if it's from the top of the tree and it goes straight on through the middle of the lens, it comes out below the middle of the tree. And the bottom of the tree in the same fashion goes through the middle of the lens and comes out here. So the bottom of the tree sends rays that are pointing up to the top of the screen. The top of the tree sends rays that are pointing down to the bottom of the screen. And by gosh, we get this tree that's upside down. Whoa, <laughs> that's optics right there. I could make this lens big. I could make the lens really big or I can make the lens really small and it wouldn't change that one bit. But if I make the lens bigger, it's gonna gather more light and that's gonna let us see better in the dark, which is why telescopes are big. We've just made a very small telescope, but our telescope is many orders of magnitude, I don't care how you slice it, better than the very first telescope that was built over 400 years ago and one that Galileo built just a year later and discovered the moons of Jupiter, craters on the moon, the rings of Saturn, the fact that the Milky Way is made out of stars and not milk, and all sorts of stuff like that Galileo discovered with a telescope no bigger than this. It might have been longer, but it was smaller in diameter. And his telescope had a little bit different optics in it. And um, in fact, the eyepiece was put in, um, the eyepiece was a negative lens instead of a positive lens. And the result is that the image was not upside down. Uh, but the field of view is so small, you couldn't see very much at all. And the glass was poor and it's lucky he saw anything in that telescope. So anyway, when you point this telescope out your window, think about Galileo and uh, the discoveries that he made with something even worse. So if he could have had one of these, he'd have been like, wow. <laughs> and if we All right, a, one more optic in here. If we get a Sorry. clear light rod, Go ahead, Joe. I think Jupiter and Saturn are still visible for a few more weeks, aren't they? Way in the south. Really? They're gonna be very low. Very low. They're gonna be very low if, if you're lucky. But the moon. The moon. The moon will be good in the scope. The moon yep. will be great in the scope. In fact, the first thing I always recommend people look at to get used to their scope is the moon. Yep, for sure. So yeah, I think we're coming up on first quarter, in fact. Yeah. Okay, now reach in your bag and you'll find a funny little thing that says 2X Barlow on it. Take that out. And you're gonna put your eyepiece into the big end, tighten the little screw and then put the Barlow into your telescope and tighten that. Ooh, mine is so loose it doesn't even tighten up. Ah. Yeah, they're not all inch and a quarters are the same. Anyway, you might have to hold it with your fingers when, when you look and you're certainly gonna have to refocus. Go ahead and point at the farthest away thing that you've got available to you and notice the difference. What happened to the image? What happened to the image? How did it change? Anyone? Still getting your Barlow's in? Make sure to take the little cap off the Barlow like I did not. <laughs> oh, right. Just black. Just black. <laughs> yeah. Right, you should be clear looking through your Barlow lens. Oh, look at that. If I put my Barlow up to my camera lens, it makes my head smaller. Look at that. It's a demagnifier, isn't it? So when you put the Barlow lens into your telescope, does it make the image smaller?
Chat it. What does it do to the image? Anybody want to be brave? Have you got it to focus with the Barlow? Now, if you can't focus inside your room with the Barlow lens, that's okay. You might need to point it out the window or get a good long hallway. Rob, I did find that to focus mine, the white piece had to completely disappear. Ooh, I think you put your lens in the, the wrong way. Flip it around. Try again. Oh, you're right. Does it look yeah. better? Now it focuses when I'm about there. Yeah, now, now look at the image quality. In fact, so let's forget about the Barlow for a second. Take your Barlow back out. Put your eyepiece in so that you just have eyepiece telescope. And now I know um, Dora said that your, your PVC is so stuck, you can't adjust it to make the lens focus. Um, I'm sorry about that. If you have any sandpaper, uh, you can sand the inside of your PVC a little bit and that ought to loosen it up. You have to do this on your own. And if you still have trouble, let Joe or I know and we can uh, we'll get you help you get that fixed. Yeah. Yeah. So. You put your, you put your, your uh, PVC into your telescope, you focus it on something, okay? And now, now take, a, take a look, how sharp is that image? Does it look good? Does it look blurry? Now what I want you to do is take your PVC out, flip it over, putting the lens in backwards, refocus and tell me if the image looks sharper or blurrier. Ew. Yeah, in my case, it's blurrier. I'll flip it back around, do it right. Do you notice that? So which way is the right way? Going back to my, uh, back to my diagram, that curved side should be pointing out at the tree and the flat side should be inside the telescope and the eyepiece is over here. So make sure you have it in there that way. If it looks blurry, even at best focus, flip it around and it should get sharp. So that's pretty much it. Now I'll go back to the Barlow. You see, it says it says two X on it, right? So what the Barlow does is it's supposed to make the image two times bigger. I won't go into the optics of that, but that's what this is supposed to do, and uh, that can be useful for looking at the moon. It's especially helpful when you've got plenty of light. If it's uh, if you're looking at something faint, um, that can make it more challenging to see because you're spreading that light out over a larger area and it gets dimmer. Okay. So that's I'll pretty much it, Joe. Is there anything you want to add? I'll bet you the students would like to know how much magnifying power this telescope has and if we can calculate. Oh. Thank you very much. It's right here. We can do that. So we measured our focal length. Right? We've got a number, and I see the chats 140, 150, 145 millimeters, 141 millimeters. On your eyepiece, you'll see that it also has a number on it. It says 12 millimeters, right? 20 millimeters, I'm sorry. I should say 20. I'm not sure. So, write down the focal length. Sorry, what, Joe? Are they all 20s? Sometimes I get. It should be. Eyes. They're all twenties. Okay. The focal length was. Yeah, I'm going to go with 38 millimeters of the objective. Okay. Right. The focal length of the eyepiece 
is 20 millimeters. So the magnification is, um, this is related to trigonometry and it's a very easy ratio. It's the ratio of the focal length of the objective to the focal length of the eyepiece. And um, if, uh, yeah, there you go, Joe. There we go. So this, this telescope makes things look uh, seven times bigger or seven times closer than they really are. And if you use the Barlow then, how much closer, how much bigger? Put it in the chat. Call it out. Just 6.9 times two, or if we're rounding off to one digit, 14. Now, here's something that I like to point out. I can hold seven times magnification still in my hand. I can't. I may have to hold my breath or lean against something, but I can't. But I can't hold 14 magnification still in my hand at all, even if I'm leaning against something. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna go back and go to my camera and put me up there real quick. What I want you to do is something we talked about earlier. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to show me here. You'd think I'd have this mastered by now. Yeah. Gallery view. Oh, there I am. I couldn't find myself. Okay. Can you see me now? Am I big? Not yet. Not to me. Huh. Well, maybe it's up to the viewer. So you can pin me so I'm big. So there you go. What I have here is a tripod that if you have a DLSR in your family, you probably have a tripod. And even if one of your parents or older siblings has an old camera, they might have a tripod. In principle, tripods should be very big and very stable and kind of expensive. But and a, a beginner's tripod that you can get at Fred Meyer or Target or something is not very expensive. Not that I'm encouraging you to go out and buy anything, but if you have one, they have this little quarter by 20 bolt. Hold it up clear. Hold it way up. We're way up by your tripod head. Yeah. There you go. There. So this is a little plate. And what you do is you take this plate and you might have noticed, remember Rob referred to two holes. One of the holes holds the bolt that keeps the lens in place. The other one is the tripod mount. So I'm just going to take this out like this and attach it like so. I now have the tripod plate attached to my telescope. And I come over here to the telescope. And there you go. And if you have one of these, that means somebody in your family already bought it and they know how to use it. Now, this is super stable. And in fact, the cheapest tripod I know is plenty stable enough for this telescope because it's lightweight. Then I can put in my Barlow, go to 14 times, and you can see, you know, Rob, do you think uh, they can see, if we could see Saturn, could they see Saturn's rings? I think at 14X, you would be able to tell that Saturn is not round like Jupiter is, but it's oval shape. You might be able to see the rings um, I think you'd have much better luck at 20 and 25 X somewhere in there. So maybe not quite. If we had that 12 millimeter eyepiece in a bar low, then yeah, you'd get the rings on Saturn. So what I want you all to do is to play with your telescope for a few weeks, look at things terrestrial on land. But of course that's a little annoying after a while because they're upside down. Um, and look at the moon. And of course it's not clear tonight, 
But even on a knife that has just partial clearing, usually the moon peeks through. And uh, either holding it by hand without the barlow, you can hold it by hand, see detail on the moon, maybe sketch it, maybe sketch it. Um, if you are lucky enough that we have some clearing and uh, Jupiter and Saturn, I think are still visible way over in the Southwest in Gabriel Park. I was looking at them just a couple of nights ago when we had the clearing, but they're disappearing fast. Mars is up, see what you can see. Um, and then when you get really hooked on this, return this, this kit to me so that I can use it in my earth and space science class. And we have a telescope lending library of about 10 telescopes that you can borrow um, that are, uh, I don't want to say this is not a real telescope. Rob often calls this a finder scope. I like that because this is more like the sort of scope that goes on top of a real telescope. Because one of the things that's hard with a bigger telescope is finding what you want to find. This helps you find it. And then you look through the main telescope and see things with more light, more magnification, more clarity. Any questions, any comments? Has anybody, come on you guys, has, has anybody not able to use their telescope at all right now? And we've got somebody with a, with a stuck focus. Anybody completely unsuccessful? Is there somebody in the chat saying something? Let's see. Actually, Rob, I'm going to rephrase no? your okay. question. I so like good. Yeah, I'd please. Like everyone who was able to see something across the room or out the window to put into the chat what it was they saw. And I'll tell you right now, I'm up in room 238 at Wilson High School. I saw the top of the radio tower. It's a tradition. Oh, yay. <laughs> yeah. I saw the top of the radio tower very clear. Um, go ahead. You don't need to wait. Just tell me what you saw. Of course, a lot of people are going to say trees. Oh, good. A squirrel, a particular tree. Squirrel, right? Yes. Good. Oh, Barlow. Dora, the Barlow is something that goes, it goes in between the eyepiece and the telescope. So you take your eyepiece out, put your Barlow in where the eyepiece went, and then put your eyepiece into the Barlow. Take the cap off the Barlow, Mr. Brown. There we go. Made that put your eyepiece into the Barlow. Yeah, you know, I'm watching my screen. So you got Barlow eyepiece going into the scope, just like that. And then hold it up to your eye, take a look and, boy, it's getting dark out. I still don't see anything. What did I do? I put it. Oh, I had a I had a cap inside of my Barlow. God, so that's two ways to get it wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, boom. Right. Is that clear, Dora? Neighbors camp or mug of tea in my neighbor's mailbox. I love Is that the supposed to not attach to the rest of the telescope? Show me what's happening, Dora. Oh, I guess I'm. The screw isn't supposed to be there, is it? Hold it. There's up. like screw. this little screw. See where no, it is? No, little my... screw on the um. Barlow. On the Barlow, yeah, it should be there, but you, sh you shouldn't be in all the way. So back that screw out a little bit so that your eyepiece can go in. If, you're, if your screw's down in all the way, your eyepiece won't no, go in. No, the eyepiece connects to the Barlow and then the screw gets a, yeah. in the way of the um, eyepiece oh, Barlow hold, part going Hold your way. scope up real close. Dora, hold your scope real close to your camera. What is going on there? Uh-oh, I see something that's not right. You have a white ring on your eyepiece or Barlow. Oh, this thing. Oh, that's supposed to be. 
that should be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pin Dora to my screen here and you went away. There you are, Dora, uh, replace mm -hmm. pin. Okay, hold that up again to your, to your camera. This part? Yeah, okay. Where is that? Okay. Oh, that's supposed to go. So, so Dora, Dora, wait, no, pull it back out, pull it back out. You got something else going on. You got a piece of metal stuck in your, in your white ring. Take that metal out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, hold that, hold that up so I can see now. You probably have an eyepiece. Here's okay. my ring. Yeah, now, yeah, take that piece of that metal ring and screw it onto your eyepiece and then screw it on real tight so they're, they do come out sometimes. Yes, there you go. That's what your eyepiece should look like. Now, make sure that plastic ring then goes into this knurled ring that then goes onto the focuser, or not the focuser, the eyepiece holder, like that. Okay. okay so, so now you should see your plastic ring you see your plastic ring on the inside of your of your eyepiece holder. Um, like yes. This. Right. Uh, I don't know. I think it's okay the way you did it. I'm not quite sure. Just go ahead and put it on. Oh, whoops. This it way. goes on. You, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you figured it out. Yeah. Goes in through the top, right? Okay, let's try. Let's let's start over again. Let's do this. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, it's okay. So you got your you got your scope like uh, like this. Hold your scope up, and I should see I should see a threaded end. Yes, there you go. Take your white ring. Mine is orange. You need to put your white ring right on the on top of that scope, and then show me that you did it. Yes, that's looking right. And then take your your cap and put it over the white ring and screw it on there. Not too tight, just let it touch down. And then your eyepiece should just go right in on, on top of that, boom. Bingo, I think you're there, yay! Now, if you wanna put the Barlow in, it should work this time. I see how that. All righty. Thank you, Dora, for, for speaking up about that. That's a Here we go. easy easy problem to have because these eyepieces go in so tight that um, some people just naturally, when they have their eyepiece in there, they just naturally want to unscrew it. And if you unscrew your eyepiece, you'll leave the, the, the metal part inside the telescope and then everything's messed up at that point. So if you need to remove the eyepiece, just pull it straight out. See that? Don't turn it, just pull it. Yeah. Okay. That is one of the one of the drawbacks of this design, but oh well. And then using sandpaper, how to get the PVC part? Okay. Pipe so on the, yeah, on the other end of the scope, um, if you take your objective cell out, it's gonna be real stiff, right? Then you're just gonna sand the inside of the black part in here. And there's probably some some big bumps in there that can be sanded down. Oh, no, sorry, the white part is the part that's stuck. This pipe. Yeah, yeah. take it out. I can't <laughs> take it <laughs> out because it's stuck. Yeah, I get you, you may need to use pliers or a wrench or something, <laughs> get help from a strong person, I don't know. Um, but once you get it out, then you need to do some sanding. So mm -hmm. we'll let or, you do that offline so we don't see you struggle. Yes, or um, yeah, I want to say, because I realized that there may have been some of you who didn't have success with this. Um, maybe a piece didn't work or maybe you got confused. One of the things, thank, we have to thank Mr. Butterfield, our wonderful ceramics teacher. He has made it so that students can come to the front of the school a couple days a week and um, do their pottery and put on their glazes. And so if you would like 
to bring your small telescope to the school one day, um, let me know. Send me an email and I'll find a time that works for everyone and I'll just meet you out in front of the school. Because at some point, sometimes Zoom is not enough. Um, or mess you with got it. it. Mess with it, show your parents, show your brothers and sisters, try to find a tripod. I will tell you right now that I built one with a kit just like you um, and I hooked it up to the tripod and I've got the Barlow to work and I can see incredible detail on the very tip of the radio tower that's up on the hill to the north of the school. And I can't, nice. wait. Nice. I can't wait to get a clear night and try to look at the moon at the very least. And I, I will say again, Same here. I, I, I hope you really get hooked on this. And then I do need to remind you that you're welcome to keep the kit for a couple of months, okay, till we get some clear weather and play with it. But sometime uh, in the relatively near future, I'm going to ask you to either bring it back to me or donate $25 to the Astronomy Club. And the reason for that is uh, I am going to do this activity with my Earth and Space Science Club. And um, I have 100 of them, 35 per section. So I need 35 kits to go. Uh, Rob put together 16 kits for this activity. And then I have a little bit of a budget for as a teacher. And we're going to put together 20 more. So we have 35. And then we're going to do this with my other students. And that brings me to my next and I think final comment. Um, what I'd like you to do is to think about the following. Those of you who are artistic, those of you who like to write, I would love it if one or a small team of you created written instructions with pictures of how to do this. I think that would be a fabulous activity. Um, yes. That would be very, very cool. And if you're way into it, even talk to me. Um, it could be just a volunteer project for the Astronomy Club. Or if, let's say you were doing the drawings, I would talk to Ms. Pearson and talk about giving you some art or science credit. Um, that would be very cool, very, very cool. All right. Well, um, Elizabeth says, if you're gonna do that, when should it be done? Well, I would say whenever you finish. <laughs> this it would be lower priority than your regular schoolwork in your house chores. Um, okay, Elizabeth, I'll make a note that you're really interested and you and I will talk. Um, we'll talk soon privately, okay? Hey, cool, I thanks, Elizabeth. Save me yeah. the work. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, yeah, you're a freshman, Elizabeth, so, um, so uh, that's great because we'll have plenty of time. You've got three more years with us, three and a half more years. Uh, Violet, did you ever show up or did something happen to Violet? Hmm. I don't see her. Yeah, that's okay. Um, next week, next Monday, I remember the, oh, next Monday is Martin Luther King Day. There is no astronomy club. I'll tell you what, I will have, uh, I'll meet with Violet and I'll have her record her the sky this month and we'll put it up on the website. And that way you can go watch it on the website. We can't put it off too long because it's timely. She did it to be from January 10th to February 10th. Okay, but something must have happened and that happens sometimes. Maxwell, are you signed up to do the sky for February? Yes, I am. That's great, that's great. Well, I would like everyone, if you at all can, to turn on your cameras and your microphone and to thank our wonderful uh, volunteer, Rob Brown. Thanks so much, Rob. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I can, thank Rob, you. Rob has given hundreds upon hundreds of hours, a lifetime of expertise, loaned tools to the Astronomy Club in the last four years. And his son, Quinn, is graduating this year. And I'm making my biggest pitch for Rob to uh, stay, stay with us till I can uh, find another. I certainly, I certainly will, as long as, long as I can. And yeah, yeah it's, it's fun. So yeah, Quinn will, Quinn will go. I'll stick around and stay in high school for him. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, uh, it is about uh, 437. And um, thanks for coming. The next meeting will be in two weeks because of Martin Luther King Day. And we have a guest presenter, uh, Kathy Cornet. She is a PhD Ooh. astronomer, although her career is science journalism. And she's gonna give a talk for us on um, what's up with Beetlejuice? 
and she has an um, she has an activity as well. And so those of you who might be interested in being a professional scientist, Kathy has done that. You might want to talk with her. And those of you who are interested in being a professional journalist, she's doing that presently. Fascinating, uh, much younger than me woman. And I think you'll enjoy her very much. So long. If you want to stay and talk to me, just, just hang around. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Hey, Joe, I, I, I do want to say thank you for inviting me. This is awesome. <laughs> it's so, I mean, I'm so glad I got here in time to like put it together. It's awesome. I'm going to see if my kids will get hooked, but so I don't know. Ron, Chow is a uh, teacher at Lincoln High School. Oh, cool. And, and um, we will not get to this at all. I mean, there is a space unit, but we are not focused on it. We're doing um, a patterns um, curriculum, the patterns yeah. physics. So, you could still demonstrate it though. Yes, you could. Yeah, I definitely, yeah. If you let and me that, get onto it and I will pay you the $25, this is totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, and you should, now that you've come, our club has decided that this club is open to any high school student in the state. And definitely to any high school student in PPS. Yes. So if yeah, you I'm have students who are interesting, we meet every Monday at 3.30 on this Zoom channel. First and third are business meetings, which can be boring until people want to take a leadership role. Any other week that we're in school, we, we have a, like an activity this time and a presentation next time. We yeah. generally alternate activities and presentations. Well, this is a nice break that I'm a student. I don't have to be teaching. Right. <laughs> this is great. Thank you That's so much. Cool. Uh, Rob, Chow um, is a midlife career change. This is her first year uh, as a professional certified teacher. Oh, wow. so she's been involved with schools and teaching her whole life. What, um, what was so horrible in your life that you had to quit and become a teacher? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> what did you do before? <laughs> oh, I've what did you do before teaching? Um, well, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> oh, just the, um, just the previous thing. <laughs> That's all. Previous, actually, I was at Robert Gray. So I know Dora. She, oh. I remember seeing her. So I worked mainly um, doing the sustainability program. It was a reducing oh. lunchroom weight. Child's so a sustainability wizard. That. She's also a mom of some incredible children. Nice. And I know this is ridiculous, but the reason I said that about Chow Rob is um, the first time I met Chow, I knew she was a natural born teacher, which is why I stressed she's uh, not a new teacher. She's a new teacher, a new certified. Right. Teacher. And right. I know you are have a great career as an optical engineer, but you all are also a natural born teacher. Um, uh, if you ever wanted yep. to make a late career change, I would definitely endorse that. <laughs> yeah, if you want to yeah. do it, I've done it. So, yep, yep. Well, I am, uh, Julie and I have been talking seriously about um, what retirement looks like and, you know, how we're going to pull this thing off. Um, maybe I could quit early and do something like that, you know. Uh, so I don't know what it would be, but I could I could totally see myself running around the world doing star parties. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm building. By the way, Joe, I'm polishing right now a 16-inch mirror in my garage, and it's going to be super super lightweight. So it'll be like portable. Where do you want to go do astronomy with a big scope? It's going to be awesome. I hope I hope it works. <laughs> hanging around because you're in charge today. Katya, were you hanging around to ask anything? Yeah, I actually like just realized that my telescope is upside down. So I, I think I missed the step. Um, oh, hold it up. Hold it up so we can see it. Okay, that looks right. You got the Barlow in. Okay. Yeah. Well, Take the Barlow out for a second and let's troubleshoot it without the Barlow so it's not too much magnification. Put the eyepiece in. Okay. Katya, when you say your telescope's upside down, what do you mean? The image is upside down. That's oh! Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's the whiteboard. You yeah. thought you were getting out of class. No. <laughs> Did you miss this part? 
Um, that part, actually, that part right there. You missed it. That's okay. In this type of telescope, the image is always upside down. Oh, uh, okay. For but some in space, yep. there is no right side up. Now, if okay. you're building yep. like a bird watching telescope, you add another feature that flips the image upright because nobody wants to see their birds or their opera or their basketball game upside down. But when you're looking in the sky, seeing a galaxy upside down doesn't really matter. Okay, right, I must have missed it. My Wi-Fi has been kind of going in and out. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make you sit through it anyway. Is real quick. Okay. okay. So if we if we have a right side up tree mm -hmm. and and a lens, I'm gonna take that part of what. There's a lens sitting right there. Light from the bottom of the tree goes through the middle of the lens, and because the middle of the lens is relatively flat, mm -hmm. we can just say that ray just keeps going straight on up. We take a ray from the top of the tree through the middle of the lens. It's gonna go down. Okay. And an image, it's upside down. And that's what you look at when you look at through with the eyepiece. And as Joe said, there's, you can put a set of prisms in here to flip the image over again. It's just a couple of mirror images, it turns out. And you get their image right side up in binoculars. But this is how astronomers see the universe. Okay, upside down. Yep. Cool. There's no up in space, so it's okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, bye. Finley, anything from you? Uh, I was just going to add, I was looking at the schedule for the rest of the year. Um, for May 24th and the 31st, are those, is, are you wanting one of them to be a presentation one or like? Whatever. Okay. They're just flexible. Whatever. They're flexible. Yeah. Okay. Did you notice that I moved your presentation? I moved the date. Um, your activity, rather. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I. It works for me, whatever. Uh, yeah, I wanted to check with you, uh, Maxwell, who's going to teach us how to take pictures of the moon using a DLSR camera, and then later other things besides the moon. He needed to do his on the date you were scheduled because we wanted uh, a more favorable moon. So in this, oh, yeah. this time, he's going to teach us to do it. But we want that week, the right after that, hopefully it'll be a little bit clearing to be a favorable moon. You don't want to photograph the moon when it's not there. And you don't want to photograph it when it's full. So yeah. I think really between crescent and half, maybe a little more than half, is, leads to more successful photos. So thanks for being a good sport. For sure. Um, yeah. So May 24th and the 30, 31st, they're our last meetings, right? So. Yep. But we're pretty well planned other than those. Yeah, there's no other. Yeah, all right, just making sure there's. I, I think we should kind of leave those two open to see what pops up. Could do kind of like end of the year fun stuff. Super fun. Easy. Yeah. What do you what do you think, Chad? Do you think we have any chance of meeting in person before the end of the year? <sighs> oh. Maybe I looked at we looked at the numbers today. Did you see that it's dropping in in the Multnomah County? I didn't, but that's good news. That's I mean the numbers are dropping. So good. I hope we can get that together after spring break, but I'm skeptical. Yeah, no, it's I think in high school I don't know it's tough because the it could be throwing routines off, and then we've already established things like being online, having that. It would just unless they knew that the last semester, last quarter would be like, you know, kind of partly truncated again. Sure. Um, the worst would be to go back and then have to return to online. That'd be very bad for the kids. Yeah, so, um, but I would like to see some of my students that really need the help. Oh yeah. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they could use a lot more help in person. It's so much easier. <laughs> it's just like, here, let me show you. <laughs> it is, it is. My AP physics class, I, there are disadvantages. We can't do as many labs, mm -hmm. but I made giant lab kits for them. There's only 22 of them. And I think these are vert, almost college students. I don't think being online has really slowed them down at all. And in fact, some ways it's better. But in my chemistry class, core chemistry and sophomores, the bottom 20% are so much lower than usual because just what you said. It's easier to show them in person, and maybe half of them, half of them, maybe eight students, they avoid me. Whereas when they're at school, I find them in the hallway and I make them have lunch with me. I feed them, I feed them, I trick them, I give them cookies, and I say, "Let's do some chemistry." 
<laughs> but if they don't come to Zoom, I don't know how to catch them in the hallway. <laughs> so the, yeah, the, I got like eight students. You know, I over the course of my career, you know, one percent fails. You know, <laughs> you have to really gonna... want, want to fail. But this year, it's more like ten percent, and it's it's talking. Mm. Chow's friends with my wife Amy Rob. It's just driving me crazy, and Amy is just trying to convince me that it doesn't help anybody by me going crazy. I'm gonna head out. Thank Bye. you. Great to see you. Good job. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, I did something that was kind of um, unconventional. So I went to that webinar given by uh, Stanford Children, and they talked about, you know, uh, freshmen. So I teach mainly freshmen, and um, giving them 50% instead of a zero. Mm -hmm. So that improved a lot of students who were just on the verge. So that helped. But then the question I have is, you know, as an instructor, like, are they understanding really? Are we able to get them to move to the next level? That's tough. That is so hard. Yeah. I don't know. Because next year it's going to be not so pretty. Yeah, that's very true. Well, Chow, once it gets a little better, we should um, yes, comfortable. come over. We have a heater in our front yard. I know Amy would like to see. Heater you. in front yard? Did you put like? He does. Yeah. And if it's not nope. freezing cold out, uh, it's like one of those restaurant radiant heaters. Oh, OK. Yeah. And, um, you know, we bundle up and we mask and we sit up. We have like two sets of friends who we see like once a month each. Uh, I know Amy would like to see you to talk other stuff, and you and I should certainly talk. Um, oh yeah. Talk teaching. Yeah. First year teaching and first year and a pandemic. I'm surprised that you're look you're looking so good and smiling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can hear my son was coming in here. That's my older son. He's a kind of a well, he's a he's a senior, but he's going to actually take another year at at uh, Wilson. He took a year off his junior year. Right. So he's going to finish another year because he's like, this is not a year at all. Um, there's I don't right. know, just a, it's not what he expected of high school, high school experience. So um, but he comes in and he wants me to help him with his Spanish like project. They're making him well, AP Spanish is like making him do like a, two cooking things. He did one earlier. Now he has to make empanadas. So he's like, you're going to help me at least show me where the lard is. Right. And I was like, no, right now I'm in a meeting. I can't show you where the water is. Mm. Oxali's a pretty amazing kid. Though. Yeah. Oh my. I'm like, I'm sold on science. He just, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's a tough one to get. I love science, but he, he loves other things more. So I don't know. Mm. Speaking of uh, kids who are trouble. I think that I, I was just going to say, I think that we're all scientists and we just don't know it, but we all, we're all born that way. And, you know, we got to know, we got to investigate and explore the world and figure out, figure it out. And then we get, we get turned off in middle school. Well, you know, that um, Carl because, Sagan quote, I don't know. Carl Sagan said back when he was yeah. a lot, of course, he said, whenever I walk into an elementary school, even if the kids don't know who I am and I've been on television, but they hear I'm a scientist and I brought some stuff to show, they just go nuts. And I, I walk yeah. into a high school and I, I can't do anything yeah, and they're like, about me. Right. Um, interests them at all. What happened in there? I'm paraphrasing him, of course, but I've been asking myself mm -hmm. that time. But I need to say goodbye to both of you because believe it or not, I have a student meeting me in Zoom in a couple of minutes. Okay. It was a girl who got a zero, not an F, but a zero all first quarter and hadn't done anything second quarter. But I did an intervention with her, which I won't describe, but I may describe to you later, Chow. It involved several people. But here's what it really involved. It involved hand delivering a paper packet so that she could learn chemistry in paper. Yeah. And then she um, she's actually decided she didn't want me to come to her house to pick them up again. She wants to take the bus. And she I have a cardboard box. Well, you saw it, Chow, outside yep. the school. And she brings me her work <sighs> once a week. And then I look at it. And it's there you go. And we go over it. This, wow. this, girl, this girl lives in a, in a loving household, but she's the primary caretaker of the two younger cousins. The uh, adult in the house has some medical issues. And um, being on the internet to do her work didn't work. Now, she could be on the internet 
for 10 or 15 minutes twice a week to talk with me. And I was able to change mm. the grade from an F to a C first quarter. And I, I, I can't say yet, but we're headed in the right direction. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to replicate that with others because um, yeah. and here, she, she's a, a, a woman of color. I just tried it now with some financial issues in the family, not enough adults. I have another kid who is a, a privileged white boy with two loving parents who are both professionals, who has no learning disability, but totally, and he's a sweet kid though, totally shut down. I just, because it worked so much with the first student, I tried it with him and I, I can't say we've had as much success yet, but it's heading in the right direction. So I wish I would have thought of this sooner. There may just be some kids for whatever reason, for whatever reason, the internet just doesn't work and yeah. they, need, they need paper. Well, but yeah, another discussion another time, but yeah, creating that. Yeah, I'm gonna go, bye, thanks, thanks Joe. You, Rob, you're the best. Yes, thank yeah. you, John, I mean, Rob. <laughs> yes, well, um, yeah, I agree. But so like the units that they have designed, there is a paper packet for this unit coming, so I can do it, but I don't know about the next last unit. I can't, I could, I'd have to, you know, modify it for them. So it's so much work as a first year. So. It's an enormous amount of work, Chow, and I'm not a first year, I'm a 36th year. Um, <laughs> and I work pretty hard and my kids are grown. You know, Ruby's not really grown. But uh, Mate in fact, Mateo, you know, he's moved back in with us. Don't tell anyone this because I could get in trouble. He is doing a lot of my grading and even uh, writing some material for me because, you know, he's a college graduate and he's a lot like me and he kind of feels bad that he hasn't found a job yet. He shouldn't. It's a pandemic. And uh, he can't afford to pay us rent or room and board. So I said, well, pay, pay, pay me and do work for me, man. And uh, he's really, really good. Yet even with his help, I can't keep up. I have, do you have two preps? Yes, just two prep. No, one prep. I'm only teaching one content. First year teachers should only have one prep ever. Teachers. This year I, I have three preps. And even from la last year I had four preps. I don't know how you do it. It's, it's hard. Well, I'm experienced, but I'm getting too old for this man. Um, and I will tell you, my AP Physics C students, thank goodness I have Mateo, and thanks goodness those 22 students are self-directed, because I am not giving them a lot, because core chemistry is taking everything I got. Oh, I know. The everything I got. I mean, to be fair, I'm teaching the AP Physics C students. They're going to do well on the test. But thank goodness I can kind of give them work and say go, and they actually go. Mm -hmm. I can see they want to learn it. I actually grabbed the AP physics book because uh, I have to say I'm rusty on my physics. <laughs> but I know you got to go. All right. I gotta go. Good to see you so long. Yeah, bye.